perhaps no other socialist project, represents the international ideal more than the three internationals. To commemorate the long history of socialist cooperation between the working classes of nations around the world, here is a somewhat brief history of the three internationals. The first organization to emerge in Europe with the stated goal of uniting the working peoples of the world was the International Working Men's Association, otherwise known as the First International. They held the first meeting at St. Martin's Hall in London in 1864. In attendance was German representative Karl Marx, who would ultimately become the group's primary author and theoretician. The First International lasted, I believe, into the uh, early 1870s, and then it was dissolved. And the First International wasn't like the other two. It was more mixed ideologically. There were a lot of anarchists and other groups, a lot of infighting. And that's one of the reasons that uh, it was gotten rid of. When Paris workers seized power in the city to form the Paris Commune in 1871, succumbing to the French military two months later, internal strife of the IWA between the anarchist ideology of Bakunin and Proudhon and the socialist ideology of Marx sharpened. This ideological split resulted in a real split between the Bakuninist faction and the Marxist faction in 1872. Most people don't realize this, but it was set up in the United States, in New York. And one would ask why, and it's because of the oppression by the European governments against communists because of the revolutions that took place in 1848. I believe the first communist clubs were set up in America around 1858, almost exclusively by German communists who had fled the failed revolution associates of Marx, etc. We had the Communist International. It supported the North during the Civil War. Marx and Engels, of course, uh, wrote and corresponded with Abraham Lincoln, congratulating him on his win. There were communist units that actually fought in the Civil War of German communists. So our history goes way, way back in this country, and I'm proud to say that the U.S. was the first place for the first international. The Marxist General Council decided to stake their hopes in the emerging labor movements within the United States. A total of 30 sections of the IWA were organized in the U.S., with strikes and unionization supported by the IWA growing their popularity within the American labor movement. In spite of this, opportunists, utopians, and regional splits saw the IWA become increasingly disorderly. Additionally, its very existence became justification for reaction in many European countries. As such, Marx declared that the organization should retire into the background and instead allow regional and national labor organizations to take charge, ultimately spelling the end of the first international. The second international came into being, and it was more Marxist. It was more united. And of course, it lasted till, uh, well, it lasted for a long time, but there wasn't a major split from it until uh, World War I. The London International Trades Union Congress announced an international meeting in Paris in 1889. This first conference in Paris hosted representatives of political organizations from over 20 nations. They passed resolutions regarding labor regulations, including, most notably, the eight-hour workday. This particular demand of the conference inspired the group to commemorate May 1st as International Workers' Day in honor of the Haymarket strikers in Chicago who took to the streets for the purpose of demanding an eight-hour workday. The Second International officially organized itself under the International Socialist Bureau in 1900, which served as the executive committee for the international actions of the organizations represented in the Bureau. The ISB would support independence movements around the world, such as Cuba, Armenia, Poland, and most prominently, India. However, the end of the Second International effectively came when World War I broke out in 1914. Although the organizations of the Second International previously committed to denouncing and protesting against war, censorship, and persecution against sedition, as well as the more liberal and nationalist ideology of some of the organizations, meant many parties abandoned an international denunciation of militarism and instead turned to supporting the war effort of their countries. Nonetheless, the revolutionary movements, such as the Spartacists and the Zimmerwald movement led by Lenin, denounced the war as an inter-imperialist conflict initiated by the ruling class and paid for by the proletariat. The U.S. Socialist Party, though, did not uh, support the war, and they opposed it. Eugene Debs, of course, went to prison for it, and there were a few exceptions. However, Lenin was correct in his analysis of the Second International, and he set up the Third International to replace it. As the horrific fighting of World War I ravaged Europe, 
Lenin, advocated for the working class and the war-torn nations to seize the opportunity presented by the state's focus on war to take power. Ultimately, the first revolution to be born of World War I occurred in Imperial Russia, first the February Revolution and then the October Revolution, in which the Bolsheviks seized power from the parliament and established the first Soviet government. As shown by the Paris Commune, the Bolsheviks knew they had to strongly defend their revolution from the global reaction that would follow, and they believed that the most effective way to weaken that reaction would be to spread the revolution outside of the borders of Russia. As such, the Third International, otherwise known as the Communist International, was officially declared in 1919 with the goal of supporting the growing revolutionary movements around the world. During this period, uh, you had the Third International, in the beginning, mobilized all the communist parties, gave them directions on how to fight to form guerrilla organizations in France and Yugoslavia and around the world. It helped the Chinese party. Uh, every party had, had people that were assigned to it from the Third International. Now, these people were there to give advice not to make rules. Here in the United States, it was the left wing of the Socialist Party that uh, broke away from the Socialist Party and formed the two communist parties at the beginning. And it was the, and when they both applied to join the Third International, they were denied until they united into one party. And that party had something like 60,000 members. And then of course, the capitalists reacted and they raided the party headquarters all over the country deported tens of thousands of people, and the party went down to about 10,000 members and had to rebuild. And this is, uh, this is normal when you're fighting state power. Unlike the other internationals, it was based in a country that the capitalists couldn't get rid of, and that's the Soviet Union. And uh, they would have congresses where they would get together and discuss things. I think the most famous congress was uh, the one that Dimitrov led where they came up with the idea of the Popular Front because of the rising of fascism. And that's probably the most famous of all of them. Ultimately, World War II and the Soviet Union's alliance with the US and the UK led to the dissolution of the Third International in order to calm the fears of the US and UK that the Soviets would incite revolutions. Additionally, the USSR felt that with the reactions the Third International encountered in aiding revolutionary movements from its inception in 1919, the common turn would only hurt those revolutionary movements' progress within their own countries. And World War II came, and uh, the Third International uh, lasted until, I think, 1943, and it was dissolved. And people say, well, why was it dissolved? Was there some ideological differences? Was there a bourgeois penetration? No, none of the above. It was dissolved because there was a Popular Front alliance, the most successful in history, between the Soviet Union and England and the US. It was done to reassure the Allies that right now we're not interested in overthrowing you, we're interested in overthrowing Hitler and Mussolini and Japanese militarism. And that's why it was done. And the Third International, I think, was a very good organization, but they came to the realization that the class struggle in every country is so different uh, that you can't have a central authority. And you can imagine uh, what's good for England may not be good for New Zealand or China or South Africa. And so they dissolved it for that reason as well. Those, I think, are the two main reasons. So what replaced it? Well, it was replaced by the workers and communist parties. They began to have congresses, and they began to meet, and they began to talk, but it was structured totally differently. It was structured in a way where different parties, while they still were unified on international issues, and that's a necessity for communists, they also didn't try to uh, tell other parties how to put the line in on a world scale. They allowed uh, people to take different positions. And we have that today in SolidNet. I believe it was started by the uh, Greek party. And it's, I believe, I'm not sure, about 116 communist parties worldwide. So we still have an international today. And uh, not everybody agrees on certain subjects, but we're all in agreement that we're communists and we're here to fight against capitalism. And so I don't think you could ask for more unity than that. Internationalism, 
The form may change, but the content is internationalism. It means working with other workers around the world. There are problems against nuclear war, ecology, and things that we can all agree on. But we all fight in our own way in the overthrow of uh, the bourgeoisie of our own countries. And that's it.